So we're going to start off first with uh, uh, Professor Joran van der Hoven, who's from the, uh, is a Professor of Ethics and Technology from uh, Delta University, and he's a permanent member of the European Group on Ethics, and has uh, worked closely with the European Commission, advising them on these sort of issues. So we're going to uh, hear a bit of, from him first about uh, responsible innovation, and we'll have a few Q&A, &Q and, and then we'll move on to our second speaker. So I'd invite uh, uh, Joran to come and... Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. You're very brave. You probably could also have been sitting outside with the kids on the terrace. It's uh, not the weather, but it's um, you're here, uh, and I would like to share my ideas on, on responsible innovation, and more specifically, uh, the core idea, which I really think is is novel and sets it apart from all other approaches, uh, ethical approaches to uh, technology and innovation that we've had in the past. And I will also explain how I came, uh, came to be involved um, in the work of the European Commission. Now, we, um, we have, uh, of course, uh, disruptive innovations, and we have uh, frugal innovations. Are you familiar with this? frugal innovations? What it means? No. Frugal innovations are the stripped down versions, the simpler versions of the things that we developed in the West and then exported to developing countries uh, that are more robust, more affordable. And the interesting thing is that now we find that they often come back because we think, okay, they're more, they're cheaper, they're equally good in, in, in providing the score functionalities, and they're more robust. Why don't we use them? Uh, so there's a big paper in the Harvard uh, Business Review that uh, tells that story. Uh, things come back. Uh, open innovations that you are familiar with, of course, that is involving uh, innovation processes involving many of the stakeholders, customers, and universities. And, governments, and then there are responsible innovations. And this all starts with the idea, okay, some things, new things that provide new functionality are really good to have. It's great. It's wonderful. We can have a discussion about it, we will have later on about the, these things, whether these are good ideas, but the rest, uh, and we can give many, many examples, innovation, wonderful. Um, but there are also some things that are obviously not so good uh, to have. Um, you can see a couple of examples, and on the left, bottom left is uh, thumb screws. In the 17th century in the Netherlands, uh, I've seen treatises on you know how to engineer and design uh, more effective thumb screws uh, to inflict more pain without crushing completely crushing fingers. Well, you know, uh, a lot of ingenuity and creativity applied there, but uh, it may probably be, uh, be uh, could be used in a better way. So the first question that we should always uh, pose when we think about new functionality, innovations, things that allow us to do certain things that we couldn't do before, is uh, it's innovative, but is it good? And um, so a simple example of something that is obviously uh, good um, is uh, a mechanism built into a spoon that counteracts the tremor of patients with uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, so they can they can eat by themselves. They don't need any assistance. Uh, so it restores their autonomy and their independence. So it's a it's a simple device, and it's uh, it's, it's great to have. And now let's look at a at an uh, an application of the Internet of Things, which is so-called Amazon Dash button. And um, so it's something like a magnet you can stick onto your fridge, and you can push it, and you can order the stuff that you need over the internet and it's delivered on your doorstep in the quantity that you would require. Uh, in this case, it is uh, Kraft macaroni and cheese. So if you run out of that stuff, you push that and it's, you know, a ring goes and they, uh, well, that's, that's wonderful, that's, that's great. It solves a couple of your problems. I wonder whether pushing the button here is, is uh, <laughs> will be delivered in time. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so uh, that, that's a great idea. And Amazon is really kind of working on this and selling it. Uh, but when you think about it, there's a lot of stuff that we use uh, in the household uh, here in Europe and in the States and in China, of course. And before you know, the house is, you know, it proliferates. And, so the idea is the Amazon Dash button, it's, an, it's a wonderful application of the Internet of Things, but is it really helping us? So that's the first question. It's innovative. It is a new uh, application of the Internet of Things, new functionality, but is it really helping us? So the question is, can we please aim at solving urgent and important 
problems where we can really make a difference. And it's not as if there is a shortage of those problems, because you know, we have many, many big problems that we uh, hope to be able to solve before 2030. Um, we call them the Millennium Goals, or the Grand Challenges, and now they are known under uh, the label of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And all the United, in all the countries in the world came together in 2015 uh, in uh, New York, and they signed uh, the, uh, the treaty on, uh, on the Sustainable Development Goals. And that's, uh, we, we, it's 17 of them, each broken down in 10 more specific ones. Uh, interesting to note is, is that the UN, for the first time, being composed of politicians, diplomats, and the people with a political science, international relations background, uh, started to realize that uh, technology and innovation are really important here. Um, so they used to think about these things uh, with a legal background or with a political background and have a glass of wine and talk about them, but now they realize that they need to bring in applied science, technology, and innovation. It's either part of the problem or part of the solution, and probably both. Uh, so they have created a new, uh, a new mechanism, um, institutional mechanism, the technology facilitation mechanism. So every high-level UN meeting is now preceded by a gathering of scientists and uh, engineers to see what kind of clever solutions we could bring uh, to, uh, to the table in order to solve those problems. Now, in Europe, this is quite common because we are used to thinking about our responsibilities, what are the big problems, what can we do to uh, help uh, to solve them. Uh, and uh, this goes back to uh, the Lux Declaration 2009 when Sweden was presiding over the EU. They already said our, all our efforts and our uh, investments in R&D should be geared towards those big problems. Of course, there is curiosity-driven ERC money uh, that is just given to people who are excellent in their field, uh, not that they can you know, have the carte blanche and, and don't need to think about ethics, as we just discussed in the, in the panel before. But uh, different requirements, different uh, criteria uh, applied. Uh, it was recently restated in 2015, uh, so um, tackle grand challenges through uh, alignment of research, global cooperation, and achieving impact. Restated in 2014, when Italy was presiding over the, uh, the European uh, Union, um, and uh, states that RRI, responsible research and innovation, is a central objective across all relevant policies and activities. Uh, and uh, so we're moving from science and society to science in society. It's part of society, it's a social thing, but now, uh, foregrounded the idea that science should help society, science for society. And it's interesting to note that the European Commission is putting its money where its mouth is, uh, because out of this 800, uh, 80 billion euros that went into Horizon 2020, 500 million was uh, um, uh, allocated to responsible research and innovation. And a good part of that already has been spent. There's a little bit left, so if you hurry up, you can just uh, apply for it. The good news is that in Horizon Europe, the framework program 9, uh, this will be continued. This idea of responsible innovation, which I will explain what it, according to me, it is, um, uh, will be continued. Uh, and there will be a lot of attention to open science and to uh, citizen engagement and involvement and upstream engagement, etc., um, and dialogues with stakeholders. But uh, responsible innovation will still be on the table as an organizing concept. Um, I was asked the, uh, by the Commission in 2011 to chair a committee to advise the European Commission on how to integrate it into Horizon 2020, and this was based on the fact that I had uh, some experience in doing this for the Netherlands 10 years ago. We started to think about responsible innovation as a, as a Dutch Research Council program. It's quite successful as the is that the program of the Dutch Research Council has been running for the longest uh, time, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's still, they keep the ball rolling, and it's, it's really bringing together medical research, um, you know, um, technical research, uh, the humanities, the social sciences, and it's really cross-cutting and bringing together many, many people from many different fields. So it's a, it's a, it's a big success. There's a, there's a website, you can go to it, lists 60 projects that have been awarded uh, until now, and they bring together people from the humanities, the social sciences, law, economics, uh, engineering, 
uh, and applied science, and they need to come together and in a significant and meaningful way work together on a project that society actually, companies or NGOs and civil society has uh, put up their finger and, 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 and declared that this is a really serious problem. It's not something, you know, a couple of academics riding their hobby horses, this is a significant problem. It, is, it, it could be on that list of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, the official instrument of the Dutch government is the, uh, the, the top sector uh, policy. So it has all the things that the Netherlands is pretty good at. A lot of uh, agriculture. Um, it's a small country, but surprisingly, we're very good at that. Water and uh, civil engineering in this field. Uh, you know, flowers. What do you have? <coughs> but uh, responsible innovation uh, is there in every segment, in every sector of that. Uh, and it's a, it's a um, these people were also, there's a former Prime Minister, you know, the Balkan ended, but this is the CEO of, of Unilever, uh, who entered into a treaty or uh, an MOU with Ban Ki-moon, then the uh, Secretary General of the UN, on a global business compact, on uh, that the global businesses would support these goals and would try their best to, uh, to help to come to uh, solutions. So what are we talking about concretely here? Um, I'll give you, uh, when you quickly through a couple of examples. Uh, the ethical fare from the Dutch example, which is a, a very nice case. I will also have some, some failures also from the Netherlands, so I'll be free to give you some, some, some successes as well. Um, so this fare from uh, picked up a couple of uh, innovation prizes also in Paris at the climate, climate uh, treaty uh, conferences. Um, so these blue labels uh, refer to ethical or social requirements. So the stuff that it's made of should be taken, uh, preferably, from countries that are not run by dictators to fill their coffers. Uh, it should have a routable operating system, replaceable batteries, com its components. Uh, it's, it's designed to be components so you don't have to throw away the whole thing when uh, a piece of it is gone. Uh, you have to pay the people who are working on it a decent wage, etc., etc. So the design satisfies, accommodates six ethical things that we want. So as six ethical things we want are accommodated by one design broadly conceived, right? So these are things that pertain to the thing itself, to the company that makes it, to the processes that, that, that underlying this whole thing. So um, this is the container and uh, so uh, it, is a, it is a little bit of a problem. Um, because 40% of the containers goes empty around the world, and these are incredibly big polluters, right? even more than, than all the cars in the world. But um, so, if we could make a foldable container, as we've designed in Delft, uh, well, you could put four in the space of one without having to change the whole infrastructure the cranes and the caves and the ships, etc. Then that would be a big gain. From, from the point of view of sustainability. So what you've done in this design is that you, you satisfy all the requirements that the ordinary standard container satisfies plus sustainability. So you have done this. And from an ethical point of view, you have made some progress, actually. So this is tidal energy. This is in the southwest part of the, of the country, Zeeland, where we have a lot of water problems. Where I live, my house is six meters below sea level. So we need to keep the water out. So water safety is first in the Netherlands, right? Um, so that's flood defense. This is a storm surge barrier. But it also is made in such a way that it produces blue energy and that it allows us to manage the ecosystem to get salt and brackish water in the right proportions there in order to, uh, to support uh, fish and uh, wildlife. Um, so it does three things at the same time, this design. Uh, same thing here, this is keeping the water out. Uh, Dunes, uh, people like to go to the beach, they come with their car, they park their car, it's, you know, it's ruining the beautiful side of the sea in the dunes. So what we've done is we have fortified uh, the, the, the dunes by building underground garages. Uh, so we've combined safety, recreation, and environment. Uh, same thing for up north, a big redesign of, uh, again, uh, waterworks, dikes. Uh, so we are building with and for nature migration of fish and, and birds, uh, renewable energy, and so we combine mobility, recreation, and wildlife. Um, new sort of asphalt, bitumen, uh, that reflects the light much better. You need to, uh, you can 
can do with less light, so it's an energy uh, reduction. Uh, the, uh, the bitumen is designed in such a way that it provides more traction to the tires, so it's more safe, and it's also less noisy. So you combine silence, sustainability, and safety. Three things that you want from a societal, ethical point of view in one go, one fell swoop. Um, these are other examples. Uh, this is a turtle excluder device, so you, you have a fishing net, so you're fishing, uh, but you don't want to catch the turtles and the dolphins, so you, you design it in such a way that you can have your cake and eat it. Your fish, uh, not the turtles. Uh, so this is a printed uh, 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 3D printing of uh, prosthetic devices in Delft, uh, and the material that it's made of and the way it's printed uh, gives you three things that you desperately want in these cases. That is, uh, the uh, proliferation of uh, blood vessels, of uh, bone tissue, and, uh, and the surface is such that it is not very hospitable to bacteria. So it kills the bacteria. So three things you desperately want by one design. Okay, so you've, you've got the picture. So you have your moral values, and you can go on and on and on. And you have, you come up with something that satisfies all of these things in one fell swoop. And that's exactly the idea that we had in this report that was the starting document for Horizon 2020 for this idea of responsible innovation. So apart from all the stuff that we already know what ethics and technology should be doing, and there, are, Philip will talk about all the ways that we can do this actually, this is just a very rough indication okay, identify serious problems to solve. This is the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. No frivolous stuff, not the iPhone 7.0, 8.0. Marginal increases in functionality. Please aim for the things that urgently need to be solved. Think in advance about consequences and alternatives uh, that are open to you. That's just what ethics means. You think about the consequences and think about alternatives and what you could do and assess these consequences and alternatives in terms of explicit ethical considerations of moral values. Is this actually increasing justice, fairness, equality, privacy, sustainability, safety, security, autonomy, body da How many values are there? 73, 123, we will recognize a value uh, when we see it. By the way, we have a prize awarded for in our Delft Design for Values Institute who for the student who writes the best paper, what the hell is a value? So if you feel motivated, please send in your paper. Um, um, and then so evaluate, and so you, you involve a lot of the stakeholders that will be affected directly or indirectly by the thing that you have in mind, the innovation, because these people will point to certain value considerations that you may forget or are obfuscated. Uh, and now, so this is all the standard stuff that we are used to under s different labels, right? Whether it's technology assessment or constructive technology assessment or... Um, but here is the, the new thing. The new thing is that this is all ethics uh, or social science or economics or law. And now the trick is to turn all of this into a requirement, something that you can and your colleagues at the technical departments can design for, that can be coded for, that can be programmed for. So that's the, that's the move. So what are the examples that I've provided examples of? Right. I think a key feature of responsible innovation is the design of new functionality that allows us to expand the set of obligations that we can satisfy. First, I could only satisfy one or two, and now I have thought of something clever that gives me the opportunity to, to do more of the things that I ought to do. That's the core idea. And in order to appreciate that fully, I think there are two things that you have to bear in mind. First point is values can and will shape designs, and conflicting moral values, um, cases of what we call moral overload, can be accommodated by design. Um, first point, uh, we all know this example. Probably. Who doesn't know this example? Yeah? Okay. But the rest, we all know it, right? right. Langdon winners do artifacts and politics? No. Okay, so this is a low hanging overpass. 
the, the guy wrote the paper, Do Artifacts Have Politics? Um, it's still there, Brooklyn, in New York. And the story is, the short story is, these things were designed in the early uh, 19th century, uh, 20th century, uh, intentionally low, so as to prevent buses to be routed from poor black neighborhoods to white no class beaches. So there's a there's a whole story about this, and some people you know are not in agreement with the historical accuracy of the story. But um, it, it, my point doesn't hinge on this particular example. It's a very striking example, um, and I think there's definitely something to it. But um, you're the designer, the urban planner, the town planner Robert Moses had racist ideas in order. And he, and he turned them into reality, and the, the, these racist ideas materialized because this was constructed as a kind of a racist barrier. It prevented uh, people to go to the beach who were living in black poor neighborhoods. Right? So that is, that's a way to express your, your value into, into. And of course, once you've seen this, you see it everywhere. Where people design things, you know, they built in their ideas of what, what people should be doing or what they preferably should be doing. And uh, so this is the centennial light bulb. You know, we can, we can design things in, in such a way that they will break sooner than they need to break because we want you to buy more of that stuff. This has been burning for 100 years, right? We can make those things that can burn for 100 years, but we want you to buy the next one next month. Uh, and we can design websites for addiction so that people will stay on them more and they click, the click-through rate will be higher and uh, you know, they will be buying more stuff. And of course, this works because the, the science of nudging shows this. This has really been booming. Nudging has been booming. It's been applied everywhere. Every self-respecting prime minister has a, uh, a whole group of nudgers around him to, see, to make sure that the policies will be successfully implemented and people will behave in accordance with them just to, to play with the choice architectures. Right? So, that's, uh, so these are nudges. You can design things in such a way that the probability that people will behave in the way that you want them to behave will go up. So if you do it, make it very attractive, the probability that people will take the stairs instead of the escalator uh, goes up. So, interesting, this is a fabulous example. And of course, persuasive technology is full of this stuff. This is the, the Dutch example. You know, all the all the degrees of freedom are still there, but you're kindly invited to you know focus. Um, so these are all choice architectures that prompt people not to uh, to exhibit a certain behavior. So this is the point: is you have a value, you have an idea, and you can actually manipulate people to, uh, in a, in a neutral sense, manipulate people to. This is the best example I have, which will like the low hanging of the cross will drive the message home immediately. So you can subscribe to The Economist, which I recommend you to do because it's a great journal. Right. Uh, so you can subscribe to, to it uh, in the following three ways. You can take an online uh, uh, subscription for $59, or you can take the print for $125, or you can take the print and the web for $125. Now, it will not come as a surprise to you that most people will say, oh, that's great. This is, this is, this is what I will do. You know, I will have both of them for 125. So this is your choice architecture. This is the way your options are now designed and lined up for you. Now, so these were these. Now look at this choice architecture. You have only two options. You can take the online for 59, or you can have the print and web for 125. Now most people said, well, forget about the paperwork, you know, give me the, this one. And uh, so you see that how you line up your choices will push people to a particular option that you want them to pick. So this is a science. You can get your PhD, you can study, you have your minors, there are your whole, you know, uh, courses. And um, they're all about lining up choices for people, whether it's about mortgages or about you know, telephone subscriptions or uh, all, all things where people lose their way. You know, start to compare options and they do Excel sheets and they have discussions with their wives and they you know, always, what shall we do? And they always go in the direction uh, that people want you to go because it's a science and it works. And it works in finance and it works everywhere where people design options for people to, to choose 
So if, if, if a pipeline goes from A to B, it doesn't go to C. It may be trivial, but it could be really important for the people in C. So, and now we're building smart cities from A to Z. Right. Everything is designed and everywhere a value, a choice, an idea about how the world will, should look like is expressed and implemented and it will affect the behavior of people who are running around it. So it works and it's really true. Churchill said, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. We will become like the things that we have built. So that's the value in design. Values are built into information system at every level. What you see in front of you, what you use, what you carry around is consolidated choices that have been made by other people you know, during a whole process of R&D and, and, and science. And, it, and it's creeping into ontologies, the code, the integrity constraints at every level. And if you're using these kind of things, it's also there. So this is the, the, the key problem that we have to face up to and, and work with time and again, every day, when we're doing design, when we develop services and products. This is the world of ethics. There are a lot of values that we, that we think are very important. Um, values, norms, laws, ideals. This is a deontic world. It prescribes how the world of engineering, our material world, should look like, or how it should, should uh, take shape. And it could be airplanes, it could be hospitals, it could be anything. What we want is that these things that we think are very important are expressed in the right way here. And once we have done that, uh, we should be able to justify and audit that all the money that we've spent you know, to put all those values here is well spent, it's well done. And uh, uh, typically a politician uh, comes to parliament and he has to answer questions about uh, an electronic patient record system, national system, uh, is it secure, is it privacy respecting, is it efficient, etc. So he, he's constantly shuttling back and forth as we should in every little project. And we call this designing 4x. And there's a book of 800 pages where we have all kinds of examples, methodologies, etc. of how to do this. Designing 4x and x may range over your pet value. Be designing for um, uh, gender equality or democracy or safety or transparency and with each of these lines corresponds a whole community of researchers and people who are working actually on these things. So it's, it's already happening, so that's the good news. But it also signifies a design turn in applied ethics. So ethics is, this is a, a tremendously under-theorized concept in ethics. So, uh, in, sorry, in philosophy. Because philosophers have always thought about cognitive relationships to the world, describing the world adequately, predicting the world, and how it will behave, and explaining. So, but they have not thought about this very complex and strange relationship, which is a cognitive relationship of designing the world. Um, so what we do is we, we look at these values as uh, non-functional or supra-functional requirements. And then we break them down in, in more specific uh, form until we go on, until we have design requirements. So this is the idea. Values are a form of requirements. They imply, obviously imply some requirements. These are the things that engineers can work with. So this is a framework that unites both worlds, the STEM world and the world of ethics. It is not too far apart. There's actually a bridge here. And both can meet here because the people are thinking requirements can go up one level and these people here in the humanities can come down one level. Uh, and this is a kind of a common ground where they can both stand up. This is what we do with students, just value hierarchies. You start with privacy, okay, so well, this implies risk mitigation, accountability, data quality, security, for example. And then you say risk mitigation, well, for example, course training, cost training, pseudonymization. Right. Here you can, and now the, 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 the great advantage is that you can point your finger and disagree not about, you know, privacy, I'm all for it or against it. No, just give me the breakdown of this. So what do you mean by privacy for a hospital information system, for example? And now you, your discussions, your ethical discussions will have some traction. They will have some detail. And of course, you, you're, used to, you're in a better position to make some. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that we do. Now, 
Um, now we're getting to the second point, uh, and it was already in the discussions that we had before, value pluralism, and therefore a plurality of values. This is the modern condition that we are in. Right? It is about privacy, autonomy, equity, and justice. And we cannot be selective in these things. We, we need to do all of these things. We cannot say, well, what about, uh, what about transparency today? Forget about well-being uh, and happiness or dignity today. You, you have to do all of these things. Um, and uh, there, there are bound to be conflicts and dilemmas and trade-offs between them. So this is the problem of moral overload. We're constantly overloaded. We want to do such a good job that we feel the burden of all these ethical things. So prosperity and sustainability, security and privacy, efficiency and safety, accountability and confidentiality, and so much more. OK. And now the rescue uh, operation. Uh, innovation can be a way of dealing with the problem of moral overload in a surprising way. This is a bus <coughs> that exploded. It was optimized for sustainability. Very light material uh, and liquid gas, but they forgot about the safety. Uh, of course, we want a sustainable, safe bus, right? Uh, that's not, if it's not too much asked. Um, and um, here, uh, Big failure, 300 million wasted failed innovation. You probably have something going on here. Um, uh, so national electronic patient record system, uh, and then five years of work, uh, a lot of investments, and then it was rejected in the upper house because the privacy doesn't take off. So if these people would have thought, front-loaded the privacy and ethics considerations and worked it into the design, this problem would not have arisen. And the same for this, the smart meter. Right? So from a sustainability point of view, a no-brainer, because if we, if we want to reduce CO2 emissions, we need to smartify the grid. And if you want to smartify the grid, you have to introduce these smart meters. But these smart meters, if you, you take, don't take extra precautions, will send every 15 minutes uh, a snapshot of your electricity consumption in the household. And you know, with some data analytics, allow people to find out which movie have been watching on a, on a Friday night. So again, rejected in the upper house. So these people thought that they had a smart meter, but it was a stupid meter from an ethical point of view because the ethical consideration should have been built into this. And we should have had the collaboration and the conceptual framework that would bring the engineers working on that side together with the people who are worried, rightfully worried, about privacy. So what's the structure of the problem? It is sustainability and privacy, or privacy and security. You know, think about the camera problems. You know, cameras in the street, uh, our privacy versus the security in the street. Now, keep that in mind, right? So the camera, you want your security in the street above a certain threshold level, you want your privacy above a certain threshold level. This is the problem of moral overload. You want to be here. There you satisfy both of your value requirements above that threshold level. But often you're stuck with a first generation stupid camera system that gives you razor sharp images of innocent citizens and uh, blurred images of the crooks. <laughs> and so you have neither privacy nor security. <laughs> or you have a much better 2.0 camera system that you hang everywhere and you have a lot of security but no privacy. Or you decide not to hang it everywhere and you have a lot of privacy but then no security. Did you see where I'm getting at? You want a really smart camera system, not like the smart meter, but the real smart meter that would have taken those privacy considerations on board at an early stage and would have effectively implemented them. So you want a 3.0 camera system, a responsible camera system that provides you with the IT functionality, but without the privacy drawbacks. This is where we want to go. And uh, a little philosophical excursion, uh, Ruth Barkin Marcus, a logician, um, came up with this principle, and she was probably unaware of the fact that it would apply in this particular context, but if you have an obligation to do both A and B, you have a second order obligation to see to it that you can do both A and B. Because if I have an obligation to rescue you, and I have an obligation to rescue you, then I should, if I can, bring it about that I can rescue both of you, if these are genuine obligations. And I could think of something clever. I could, for example, take two broomsticks and stand over here, 
and reach out to you, and I can save two lives suddenly. And the difference between the first situation and the second is, is that I had a clever idea. And that's the innovation. The innovation is I got a clever idea how I can tweak and transform the world by some engineering, in this particular case a very simple example, but often more complicated, where I can exam expand the set of obligations that I can satisfy. And if you recall, that is what I thought was be uh, suggested is the core idea of responsible innovation. You're trying to solve a big problem in the world, but you have many things to worry about and, and, to, and values to serve. And now you're thinking of something clever that allows you to expand the set of obligations that you can satisfy. So if you can change the world by innovation today, so that you can satisfy more of your obligations tomorrow, you have a moral obligation to innovate today. That's the idea. And um, how much more time do I have? Four or five minutes. Okay. I've, I've a couple of things to say, but I will just see how we go. Um, probably a little bit more. Can all problems be solved in this way? Well, there's no guarantee because the second order obligation doesn't is only, um, let's say, an obligation to try to see. But if the stakes are high enough, then you have an obligation to see whether there is an, an opportunity reach that right upper hand white square. Right? Um, so for example, the most obvious example is privacy by design, privacy enhancing technologies. These are examples of where you try to combine the IT functionality and the privacy. And you come up with really interesting things. Uh, people are, are working, the simple example is, but there are very sophisticated examples of this. This is coarse grain. So you, you, you want to count the number of people in the room, but you don't want to uh, give away their identities. Right? So what you do is do this. So it allows you to count the number of people in the room, but you blur and you obfuscate their identities. And uh, so there's, there's a whole portfolio, a whole research uh, trying to do in, in, in a very sophisticated way to do the data in this way. Uh, Germany offers a, a number of very interesting examples. This is a, a prominent one. Uh, they were also confronted by a situation of moral overload for a long period of time. Sustainability, Green Party, a, a fierce political force, uh, very vocal, uh, very uh, prominent and, and uh, visible in society. And on the other hand, economic growth. Economic growth and jobs for people, which is a respectable thing to promote. And on the other hand, the environment, protecting the environment. How can you do that? Well, Germany is market leader in clean tech and renewable energy. They innovated themselves out of that problem. And they would not have innovated themselves out of that problem if they would not have felt the need to respect both of those obligations. If I would say, oh, well, forget about it, I'll just rescue you, right? I would never come to that clever solution of picking up two broomsticks and standing over there. So that's the, that's the idea. And when you, once, you, once you start to think about these kind of zero vision, where you say, well, no, really CO2 reduction is really very important. No children killed in the road. This is something that we really have to achieve. When you start to kind of compromise on that, then you will take away an incentive, an important incentive to innovate. Volvo is a very good example. They had to be produced in safe car because they have the most strict uh, road um, safety rules uh, in the world and therefore as a result of that they are now famous for their safe cars right but they realized that their crush dummies on which they did all the tests were modeled after soldiers kind of big Swedish guys right and uh, then they realized that oh my gosh we also have other passengers and we need to design also for them Exactly. So, so you will only think about these really interesting innovations if you really care. You, it, this, this, this care and this sensitivity ethic will open up opportunities to innovate that others will just not see. Because they have a poorer vision of the world. Of course, you can cheat your way out of the uh, problem of moral overload by pretending that you have solved the problem of most efficient motor management and um, exhaust, right? So you've solved that problem. Oh, not really. You just pretended that you solved the problem. Uh, but you see from the fact that they pretended to solve it, 
that this really is an ideal that is underlying it. So, in conclusion, values can be drivers of innovation. Moral progress can be reached by innovation, and innovation is driven in that sense by values. Um, but it requires that we, as was a theme of the, of the discussion we had earlier today in the workshop, this, we need, really need to bring together all these uh, sectors in society, um, but we, I think it requires us to look in a different way to the innovation. Well, that's what I had to share with you. Okay.